good music. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hey, we've got, we drew the time slot right after lunch. <laughs> Aren't we lucky? Yes, yes. Well, it's great to see everybody who has, uh, has volunteered to show up. There were some people that I have shamed into being in this room because I met them in the other room. But it's great to be here. Once again, my name is Steve Debris. I'm master facilitator, uh, work with organizations, uh, Integrity Solutions. We have a booth in the next room. I invite you to come by and say hello. Uh, we've been in the organizational development, training development industry for about 40 years. I've been aligned and working with them for 25. Uh, just uh, this past year, by the way, celebrated my 60th birthday. So th right thank you very much. Although the appropriate comment was, you don't look that old, but I'll forgive you for all that, okay? Uh, it's interesting. We have 35 minutes to go through some important topics. I have a hard time even saying hello in 35 minutes, so we're going to try to push through this. Uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Jackie. Sure. Okay. Hi, everybody. Ahead. Jackie Cohen, and it really is very bright up here. Uh, but anyway, I am the HR partner at the Lindy Group for our supply chain organization for Region Americas. It is not Lint, the chocolate company. I thought, I'm sure many of you have thought that because it's a very common uh, thing that people think when they hear Lindy. Um, as wonderful as a company they may be and as wonderful as a product chocolate is, it's not the Lint company. It is the Lindy Group. So we are a global manufacturer of industrial and medical gases. Uh, we're about an $8 billion organization. We are in 60 countries worldwide, and we've got about 60,000 employees globally. So uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Steve and his team, uh, Integrity Solutions, over the last year. And we want to really share Lindy's story today and, and some more of the integrity coaching process, but really share our journey on how we've really implemented a coaching culture at Lindy. So I want to set the table at first just to share some informa uh, information and insight with you. you that. That? Thank you. So. Um, at Lindy, uh, about a year and a half ago or so, we went through a major uh, reorganization like many companies, many industries. And uh, this was a global reorganization, so large scale change. Uh, we also were not performing strongly from a safety uh, perspective. There, were, there was a lot of pressure to improve safety. Uh, with this reorganization, at least in my region for Americas, I had a new senior vice president of supply chain, a new executive team. So you can appreciate the amount of change that was going on in the organization. And, and we needed something that would really uh, stabilize things or help stabilize things am amongst and amidst all the change, but also help engage our employees as well. So in talking with the leadership team and starting to exploring some things, we identified coaching as a, a method and a vehicle to help us improve some of the metrics I just mentioned about around safety performance and operational excellence and those types of things. So we had decided and we made the decision to embed coaching as a strategic tool. And I say as a strategic tool because at least in Lin at Lindy, I've been there about 15 years, we've implemented multiple coaching tools. And nothing had really embedded, nothing had really internalized. Anytime a manager, you know, you see a manager trying to use their coaching tool du jour at that time, they'd have to take out a checklist and say, you know, did I do this, this, and this. So it just really had never taken hold, it hadn't internalized. So we decided, uh, even talking with that leadership team, that we didn't want this to be a you must go out and coach. We wanted to really create a pull for this. And so we determined that we would just really try this on a genuine, true pilot basis. If it didn't fit our company, if it didn't fit our culture, we would abandon it at that point in time. So and we figured we'd, we'd learn very early in the process. We also knew that, uh, and I neglected to mention this, as part of our global reorganization, we also formalized a matrix organization. So again, like many companies, many industries, a matrix is not new. We just went about it in a more formal way at Lindy and implementing that. So that also created a need for a whole host of different and more effective communication methods and how to connect with employees on a deeper level and how to really communicate even across the matrix. And then being optimistic, even though I mentioned it was a pilot, uh, being optimistic, we recognized that we couldn't have this never-ending dependency on integrity solutions. So we knew that we needed to get some internal resources, either through line management, HR, talent management, to also get certified to be able to deploy the model and the process further and deeper into the organization. So these are some of our key focus areas that we identified together as this leadership team. So, we, so in the center, again, are these key focus areas. And we knew that we wanted to model and manifest core values. Because again, with all of this change, our, our shared purpose 
had really gotten watered down and diluted a little bit. So we really needed a way to bring that back to the forefront for employees and really give them a common thing to draw, draw ahead towards. Uh, we wanted them to have that shared purpose. We also knew that we needed to increase emotional intelligence uh, so we could strengthen two-way communication. So at Lindy, we are a very dispersed organization. Uh, just show, by show of hands, who do we have for manufacturing in the room? Okay, so mostly in the back. With, with industrial gas, at least the way we're set up, uh, we are very dispersed. So like, unlike an oil company where there might be a few hundred employees at a particular plant, most of our plants are staffed four to seven people. So it really is a very dispersed organization. Uh, again, we're going through all this change, so we really needed to be able to accelerate people's emotional intelligence just to really adapt and cope with the change that was going on in the organization as well. And then another focus area for us is we wanted to, we've, we're always in a change mode been changing the organization probably for the last six to eight years with different things and, and different business needs and imperatives that have come up, the market changes that continue to evolve as well. So we just wanted to really instill some a better way to also help team members adapt their capabilities, which would give us improved decision making. And then finally, as I'd mentioned already, we've tried numerous coaching tools or methodologies, and we, we knew we needed to really shift the culture to be able to shift management behaviors and beliefs around coaching. So as we were, th we're thinking about this, one of the things that comes to mind for us is, is what you see here is that an engagement has been sort of a theme of what we've been talking about and how we, how we build and develop that. Well, we just f believe that, that engagement really drives value creation. And we'll validate a little bit of that in, in just a couple minutes. But a couple things around this is really building alignment by making sure that communication becomes two-way and not just one way. Some of the times what we run into in organizations and perhaps in yours is that there's a lot of telling versus asking. Uh, and really, uh, it's, it, the conversation ends up being about just company goals instead of uh, multiple, uh, if you will, uh, a dialogue around individual goals and how they align with company goals. And really accomplishing that by involving pr uh, employees and how work gets done. Now, it really is a function of, of asking people questions and engaging them in that, in that conversation. Yet at the same time, organizations are much leaner. Folks are stressed for time, and one of the things is they, they, we hear pushback. I don't have time to go through the process. I just need to tell people what to do and get them going. Just by show of hands, how many times do you hear that in your organizations? Is, I mean, isn't that true? So it, we're really talking about a behavior change that needs to have a payoff for people. They really need to see something because they're pressed for time, they're stressed out, and the, and the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And that straight line is by telling folks what to do. So we're really talking about engaging people. And then providing, once we start the engagement process, is providing people with growth opportunities that are incremental steps. Oftentimes, goals are presented that are these mammoth leaps where once they're presented, and I do a lot of, uh, I've been blessed to be able to work with organizations literally around the world, a lot of sales organizations, where guess what, the next revenue target is a certain point, and no one on that team believes it's possible, often including management people. And I had a gentleman I worked with a number of years ago in Canada. He got a number that was transferred from the U.S., as they always are. And what happened was he took a look at it and he said, I'm not sure we can hit it. I, I know exactly how my team's going to react. And so one of the things that he did is really work very strategically about biting it off in incremental steps, building belief. This is all part of what we'll be talking about here. Building belief, and all of a sudden there was a momentum and acceleration that by about the third, end of the third quarter, they were on target and they actually exceeded. But, but oftentimes, the way things are communicated gets in the way. So we're really talking about setting people up for success. And I know a lot's been written about big, hairy, audacious goals. We've, we've read about it, heard about those. But a lot of times, people leap and fall short, leap and fall short. In our coaching process, we're trying to help people see the vision, but keep them focused on success. So really, and as they start to be successful, their engagement levels increase. One of the things, uh, an author that uh, I've had a chance to meet and. Uh, I, I love a lot of his work. Aubrey Daniels out of Atlanta has written one of his books. He said, people don't fear change. They don't fear change. They fear trying something new and failing at it and being punished for it. Okay? It's not the fear of change. It's trying something new, doing it poorly, and being punished for it. So in our coaching, we try to take that fear of some type of, some type of punishment out of it. So as we think then, it really then, sh we're talking about a cultural shift and moving from, if you will, coaching as a tool to, to manage 
problem performers. And I like this, we coach them out. Okay, find a way to position and move people out. And I can see some smiles here and some nods. Yes, I'm sure you've heard that language. And probably for many of you in this room, the hair stands up on the back of your neck when you hear that language. Okay, moving towards coaching behavior and skills uh, uh, that we value. What are the behaviors and skills? And I would like to use a phrase. What are the behaviors that truly the organization is renting from that person that are contributing the overall shared purpose? And I use that phrasing renting intentionally, but that's really what it is. Okay, a lot of times people say, oh my God, what is that? Rental, I don't like that. It implies temporary. How many of you have been with your organization for maybe over five years? Just for show of hands, yes. How many over 10? Oh, rental agreements have been renewed every year, okay? So a lot of folks feel apprehensive about it, but that's true. So what are the behaviors? So really what I'm doing is coaching to and from behavior. A lot of times it's about results. Coaching, uh, it's low priority. It's all about firefighting. Hey, we got so many problems going on, trying to get our hands around it. That coaching is limited to those types of situations. We're really saying it needs to become part of the culture. It's done on an ongoing basis uh, with engaged managers who then collaborate with folks. And then, uh, and, and this is really one of my, my pet peeves. I, I guess as I got to be turned 60, I, get, I, I heard low deference. I like to push back on things just a tad. And, and the hierarchy of command and control. I mean, hierarchy, gang, we talked about delusion. It's really an illusion. We live and work in relationship systems. And if we really got to thinking about it, the manager's role is to resource that team to maximize their contribution. Yet how many times do I hear managers use the shorthand that's, you know what, I have so many people reporting to me. Oh, okay, all right. And then you get, well, I have so many people reporting to me, and all of a sudden it becomes whose kingdom is a little bit larger. Okay, many organizations are trying to make inroads on that, but I like to, I like to think about it a little bit differently. So it's the coaching is a two-way conversation, especially what Jackie's talking about in a matrix where there aren't clear lines of authority now and people get confused. So how do we utilize that? And Steve, Anything before you want, like no, no, I just wanted to add too. So uh, while this is very much aligned to the Integrity Solutions model, this is very much what we went through at Lindy. So this is not just an academic, this is part of how we started to shift the management belief and culture within at least the supply chain organization. And the one thing, the takeaway out of this that I'd really like to point out is the cost of the left side when something isn't done around it. So we at Lindy, within supply chain, we were not leveraging our culture. You know, our culture was, was holding us back and hindering us, if anything else. So that shift became very important, and even the leadership team got their head around why that shift was so important. So with that, so how do we have a common language then to talk about people's experience when it comes to coaching? And part of it is getting people clear about this. So it's our belief, and as we were working with uh, the Lindy Management Group, uh, while there are many aspects to what produces effective coaching, there are five sets of beliefs that we feel are critical. And the first one is deep down, what is my view of coaching? What is my view of coaching? How do we define it? Many times, you know, processes are implemented and there's no definition really given to what it is. So we have people walking in with a host of different experiences about how they define what coaching is. And we are very clear about, about that definition. So you have some people walking in, well, guess what? Coaching is all about pointing out what people do wrong, letting them know frequently and as often as it takes in order to correct the performance. As opposed to coaching is about building and developing people. Now, what is their natural mindset? Now, these beliefs have probably been greatly impacted by our life's experiences. I mean, I think back to uh, way, way, way back. I've had a number of great coaches. Uh, I was an athlete years and years ago, but I go way back to Little League to think. I made the all-star team as, a, as an 11-year-old, and there was a gentleman, I'm not going to mention his name, you never know who's related, but uh, he managed another team, and I was so happy I did not play for that team. Uh, the way that he sort of berated kids and all that, it was just, oh, it was just cringe, uh, just cringe. And I've had coaches that are very different. So my view of coaching oftentimes is shaped and influenced by those around me. So we've got to get some clarity on that. The next piece, my view of my abilities. Said another way, when somebody has a positive view of their abilities, we say they're confident. Outward expression of an inward condition. It's interesting how many people we've dealt with where, guess what, they're, they're just not confident about having a coaching conversation, about directing, fine, but inquiry and all that, they just, that's not necessarily comfortable for them. At the center of this, and not by accident, are my values. 
values of conscientiousness, integrity, confidentiality? What are the values or behavioral boundaries about what's appropriate as a manager and a coach and what's not appropriate? And then the next one is my belief about how important is this? Where is it as a priority? How committed am I to do coaching periodically as required? And then the last one is belief in people. Uh, you know, as I take a look out, I can catch some eyes here. And this is just my predisposition. I guess I, guess I have to have this mindset to be doing the work that I'm doing. But I have just an unwavering belief that's possibility and potential that exists in every person in this room that hasn't been tapped into yet. Not because that we're trying to get more out of you for the benefit of the organization, but just that's an expression of the human condition, and I think uh, that came out in an earlier presentation. But one of the things that, that comes to mind then is, is truly how do I believe in my people? Do I believe this possibility and potential that's there? Now, one thing that happens is these lines, these arrows, represents gaps or conflicts. So if I have a view of coaching that's about telling people what's wrong, boy, if I'm competent at it, I probably do it an awful lot, I'm committed to it, but what does it do possibly to undermine the belief that people have in themselves? Or maybe I have a strong, I have a strong view of coaching, but I don't believe I can do it, and I feel pressed for time and I can't do it, so guess what, my coaching effectiveness is going to be compromised. What we want to do is help people see, develop the right sense of what coaching is, develop, and see they can do it, see how it aligns with the best of who they are, and as they do a process, they start to see people grow and expand. Their belief grows as well. They're more committed to do the process. That's what we call congruence or alignment. Now, here's what I'd like you to do at your tables. I'd like you to get paired up with someone in just a moment. And I'd like you to take two minutes. And if you have a three or whatever, fine. But we'll take about two minutes. And I'd like you looking at this model to say, as you look at your organization, what are the areas that stand out as probably the ones of greatest concern for you when it comes to a high level of coaching effectiveness in your organization? Now, this is really on an individual basis. Is it their view of coaching? Is there confidence to do it? Is it values? Is it their belief in people? Is it their commitment to do it because of all the time pressures that they have? Now, sometimes that's the excuse, by the way. That's symptomatic of something else. Okay, because coaching isn't something that we do separate. It's that is the practice field to go back to Jim's conversation. So if you would, let's uh, either get paired up or a real small group, just about two minutes. What are the critical issues you see relative to what we have here? Okay, please begin. Okay, so a lot of good discussion on this one. Could probably go on the rest of the afternoon just on this topic alone. Uh, but what I'd like to point out on this to everybody, too, is this is a real meaty part of the model, you know, from a real-life example, because I know when I sit in the seats at conferences, I want to understand how companies have really done this and utilized it and made it work. So this was a really important how for us, again, like the meat of the work here, because in the model with integrity coaching, this is where you get a baseline. So each of the leaders that went through this, the participants, they started with the baseline and understood where they were in terms of their own personal view of coaching, their experiences with it, the values, their commitment to that activity, how they believed in people, et cetera. And then at the end of the process, they go through it again and see where they've evolved and matured in the process. So what I can say for us from a real life experience is that while we didn't end up at the exact same place, nor did we want to, we ended up in a very common place. And that was really success for us because we had elevated and shifted the mindset in terms of the importance of coaching and what it could do in the organization in terms of delivering value for people. Yeah, and one of the things that, that comes to mind in, in working with Jackie's uh, managers and leaders is the, the last one on the far left, belief in people. Uh, because a lot of times, especially if we're dealing with folks and we're dealing with folks with a lot of engineering background, mm -hmm. so they deal with what is, that they're looking at, okay, the current state. And oftentimes we see gaps. We think see things that are missing instead of seeing the possibility and potential. I mean, it takes me way back. I'm from Portland, Maine, and just up the road a piece. And, and I remember years ago doing a marketing session at the uh, South Portland Marriott and asking everybody to introduce themselves. And it was a manager, a regional sales manager for a coatings company that will go unnamed. But I said, uh, he introduced himself, pretty excited. I said, so how many people work uh, for you? That was my language back there. I said, how many work for you? And he said, without batting an eye, he said, oh, about half. <laughs> and I said, OK, I got a sense for what I'm dealing with here. And I said, OK, now, on your team, how many people do you believe are capable of a higher level of performance? 
And he said, about half. And, and so I hear that far circle. I mean, those beliefs leak out. Now, maybe they would not perform to that level, but my belief will probably help to create that reality. So at the break we went out, now I was not quite as, this is like 22 years ago, not, but it stayed with me, that I was not quite as maybe articulate and smooth, but one of my adages is care enough to confront the issue, not the person. So I went out and I said, boy, I was fascinated by your response. That's probably not an accurate word. I was disturbed by it, but I said fascinated. <laughs> and, and so I looked at him and I said, uh, so you only believe about half your people are capable of higher levels of performance. And he said, yeah, that's it, just half. So I looked at him, looked at him right in the eye, and I said, gee, I wonder if that half realizes you've already given up on them. So we had that awkward moment. Uh, maybe that was a little blunt. I'd like to say he signed up and became a client, never heard from him again. I don't know, but, you know? <laughs> but, I mean, sometimes... Uh, but how many of you would agree that's probably the case? That was accurate, okay? So let's continue on. This is one of the factors, and it really then uh, involves a shifting mindset. You know, when we think about a low coaching value mindset, of evaluating, it's just evaluating the employee and giving advice. And most of what I think some managers think about is coaching is what we do on an annual basis, going to give them advice, uh, and then making assumptions about what's driving poor performance, like I'm a mind reader, being able to do that. Uh, and then assuming people have already peaked and uh, that plateau performance, much like the person I was sharing, has reached a certain level. And guess what? If they plateaued at a certain level, let's just replace them. Boy, I want, what is the cost of turnover? What is the cost of turnover? And then uh, the high value mindset we're thinking about is really my function is there to support growth and success, really understand their viewpoints and the constraints that they're experiencing. And then develop future-focused conversations. My colleague, uh, Lisa Bullock, who's down front, talks about future-focused, and, and she does that very well. And it's, that's what we're looking for, looking to the future, to really support self-discovery of people. Yeah, and Steve, I'd add here, too, this is uh, really, again, real life where we were at risk to really be spending too much time on the left-hand side, especially given the pace of our changes and the reorganizations that were going on and the the uh, improvement in performance that we needed very quickly. It was easy to make assumptions on the left-hand side, and it's just so much more important to shift the mindsets to the right-hand side. And you could see through the process, again, how that evolved and how the leadership skills got deeper, the coaching skills got deeper, because during sustainability weekly sessions where they actually get to practice the skill that they've now been trained in, you'd hear comments about, boy, you know, I can really see the trust that I'm building within my team. Um, you know, here I thought Jackie was not engaged on this process. It turns out my coaching conversation with Jackie is that she didn't have the confidence in this one space. So we start to unpack the conversation, and we really start understanding the underlying root causes of some of those things. And that's where you see the mindset start to shift in terms of how value-added the process can be. So a couple things uh, as we move on. The sort of the business case for why we do this. And, there's some great work that was written uh, out of uh, Harvard uh, a number of years ago on the service profit chain. And we've used sort of the person side of this to help people see the relevance as to why coaching is so critical. Sort of at the, now we don't have time to do this, but we unpack all these elements and get people to take a look at them. But uh, leadership really driving the pathway, if you will, to profitability and growth. So many people just look at that bottom block while they're all a whole host of elements that sort of lead in that direction with leadership driving it. And leadership really impacting that second element, which is internal quality. And if, and if it's driven on a rational standpoint and a business standpoint from those two factors, that, that when people start to coach, here's what they start to tap into. What drives employee satisfaction and, employee qu and internal quality are these two things. Employees experience they have the ability, tools, training, resources, and authority permission to produce for results for their customers. So we're looking externally at that. And how do I create value? The other side of it is what, what promotes satisfaction and, and drives internal quality. And I love this. It's characterized by the attitudes people have towards one, on the, one another and the way we serve one another inside the organization. So coaching, if you will, is the ultimate act of service, serving people so that they grow. So there's a strategic imperative that coaching needs to be part of what people are doing every day. Now, if that's sort of the strategic business case, then what is it we're really trying to influence? And, and this is something that, so what's the target of coaching? What am I really trying to address? And, and we are firm believers that you, people will perform consistent with the level of their inner beliefs. So as we go through our lives, 
and I'll, I'll do this. Uh, all those dots didn't pop up as fast as I wanted them. <laughs> but here I am at the center of my world, an X. All of us are. People that work on our teams, people we're coaching. Each one of those dots around the, re the edge represents, if you will, an unconscious conclusion about where I fit in and what I'm capable of doing. Maybe how much money I should make, type of job I should have, neighborhood I should live in, whole host of these different things. We filter incoming information and I start to, exp I start to accept it as my truth. And then as I go through my life, other people are growing up, that happens, and I got bosses, as, as I get older, all of these data points coming in, whatever, whether it be accurate or not, it becomes my truth. And if you will, that becomes, and I think Joel Barker utilized this word, word, and I think it's been overused, but it's dead on accurate here, it becomes our mental boundary or paradigm. And if you look up the definition of paradigm, it's, it's a boundary or border of belief or thought. I like to call it a self-accepted concept of limitation. Self-accepted concept of limitation. That's all I can do. And so what happens then is all my actions, feelings, abilities, and behaviors will then be constrained by this internal mental boundary that says that's all I can do. So performance then tends to be consistent with whatever that internal boundary is. It tends to be consistent with that. Now I may step beyond it, have some success, and then, if you will, self-sabotage. Anybody play golf in this room? Okay, anybody had a good round going? Okay, all right, and you know the rest of the story. The wheels came off at some point, playing way better. I was coming down the last two holes, I had a great round going, and I was literally shaking. I said, what's going on? Because it's not intellectual. Best round of my life. Managed to hold on to it, and my whole belief level shift based it on that, shifted based on that, but people tend to perform this way. So here's the prime directive of coaching then. High-performing managers really in increased performance, and we saw this really with Lindy as these conversations started to, 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 to happen, by engaging people, helping them have experiences. When they shifted their belief, guess what? They automatically expanded their performance. But I can't impose that on anyone. That is a conversation, it's an experiential process. So how do I set people up to have incremental experiences that then shift their belief about what they're capable of experiencing? So with that said, then, the five steps we're really breaking through are very simple. I mean, we've got a whole process around this, but to ask questions, to listen for where people reveal their perceived boundaries and their current boundaries, or set incremental goals just beyond, and then help them set up success. I want to set people up for success. The other thing is if they have a failure, I treat failure as learning. And in my coaching, I very quickly reframe it and say, what'd you learn from it? What will increase your odds next time? So we help people to shift the conversation so they're more willing to take the risk of stepping into that place of discomfort. And we saw that happen at Lindy. Yeah, and the additional benefit, a huge benefit that I would add on that too, Steve, is that, uh, so talking about the employee here, right, the team member, obviously, but the additional leadership development that you see occurring through this process is enormous as well because you see that leader shifting their own beliefs as well in terms of how they can improve somebody's performance. So it really has an exponential effect in terms of development on that team when they're going through this process. Not to mention also just the, again, I, in the beginning I said, you know, new team starting to work together, executive team, really very akin to a work group, not really a gelled team. And you just saw in this peer coaching that they would go through on a weekly basis, their trust level just begins to expand as well. So on multiple levels, with their team, with their peers, and upward as well. So with that, we've, uh, and the, you'll have this available, there's a lot to say here. So the perspective, why this is important, but really what we're focusing on is the how, and one of the common themes you see in that right-hand column is ask, is ask. And that really requires a shift in behavior, a shift in mindset. Now, uh, that sounds easy, but it isn't. People are under so much stress uh, and, and the tension of getting things done, that taking the time. And, I, and, and it comes down an awful lot to how people manage their, their anxiety in those moments. How do managers manage that? Okay, so a lot of this, expressing genuine desire to support growth, uh, in terms of understanding their viewpoint, really create an atmosphere of trust and asking questions because people won't be transparent unless there's a trusting relationship. And then really asking follow-up questions, not making assumptions. And then from a future-focused uh, conversation, develops a, a shared purpose of delivering goals and objectives. That's really key. So what's that mean? And we don't have time to go into all that today, but really linking, their, linking what they're doing to organizational objectives, seeing the constituencies that need to be served, 
and asking people how they can go about doing that to tap into their creativity. And then really uh, helping people come up with their own solutions. When I provide a solution un unwittingly or unintentionally, I'm, I'm sort of kind of saying, I don't believe you're capable of figuring it out on your own. And if I'm pressed for time, unintentionally what I'm doing is shooting myself in the foot and then I'm curious as to why people aren't as engaged and aren't contributing. Now with that, now I'm sure all of you have been exposed to some type of behavioral styles model, but we need to tailor then our conversation and manage my own anxiety based on my behavioral patterns. And this was yeah. the key issue. Yeah, this was, especially again, Steve had mentioned a large group of en engineers, so very more comfortable in that analytical space. And uh, for us too, just understanding the different behavior styles of each other and who's on their team, that increased their emotional intelligence exponentially as well. So there, there's three, and we're getting close on our time here, but there's three elements for me that I would say is the secret sauce for this that Integrity Coaching partnered with us on. This is definitely one of them. I've not seen, I've not come across a coaching model that embedded the behavior style so uh, deeply within the model. So again, that leapfrogged and was a step change for our leadership teams. The second, which Steve will, will get to and quickly touch upon, is really the eight week of sustainability, because that is where they practice, that's where they built their muscle. And then thirdly is just really the, the partnership between Steve as our master facilitator, Lisa Bullock as our consultant and partner on this as well. So it's really those three components that for Lindy made it a very successful model for us and that we continue to implement in the organization. Because uh, Jackie, what you're getting at then, the key is really behavior from people. And I, I, and I love this quote because we can have strategy, we can have goals and objectives, all that, but it really comes down to shifting behavior. And what do we do to shift behavior? So it really takes time. And as Jackie was talking about, one of the things that we do initially is somehow people have to be exposed to the information, get a working understanding of it, and feel capable and competent enough to go out and start to use that on the practice field. Mm -hmm. and, and we just believe in real play. You go, out, you go out and try it. But there's got to be some type of accountability and support system and structure where you're around like-minded people. So uh, that's where there's a structured follow-up. If you're implementing something like this, there needs to be some type of structured follow-up and accountability. And, and it's done from the place of reinforcing progress and success. So at the very beginning of that, you do a pre-assessment to, to, to uh, let people get sort of have a baseline of where they are. And at the end, they start to see their shift. Now, it was interesting. In some of the assessments, their scores actually went down, a self-administered assessment. And it was because they were holding themselves to a higher standard, which is always nice. Mm -hmm. So helping them to unpack that. And then how, what do you do in an ongoing basis to reinforce that? So that becomes part of it. And anything that you'd like to add around the sustainability piece? It's just the, the, not specifically on the sustainability, but just the value. I mean, we've seen value in so many ways from this model and just a maturity in the organization. Uh, it, the engagement has definitely gone up. There's deeper connections with the employees and the managers. The managers feel more confident. Um, it has improved our business performance. We have seen improvements in safety and reliability. I mean, there were a number of things going on in that space as well, but this certainly complemented those efforts. And then the last thing for me that kind of sums it up is that um, in a very healthy way, we have leveraged both our leaders and our employees to be instruments in talent development, because it's this continual focus on talent development at the end of the day, and this has really brought that to our organization. And as we wrap up, I just, I'd just i like to say thank you, and there's, there's one person, and she's going to be upset with me because I'm pointing her out again, because I'm up here sort of being the face of this, but down front, uh, Lisa, would you stand? Lisa Bullock, who's my colleague who really helped do this. Just want to make sure Lisa gets recognized. For sure. And once again, I want to thank Jackie, because in terms of uh, sort of a partner, implementing this process, uh, just an incredibly collaborative relationship to make that journey. work. It's been a good so journey. It's been a very good journey. So wish you have a, hope you have a great conference. Hope this was helpful. Please don't come by, don't hesitate to come by and visit us. Mm -hmm. Love to, love to, yeah, that was sort of a Freudian, wasn't it? Yes, <laughs> there we go. No, please come by, visit us. We'd love to have a chat with you about this. Yeah, and, I'd love uh, to talk with anybody as well. Yes, yeah, so right. have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you.